to Maharaji, of whose blessing this is a manifestation. The Heart Cave Except ye be converted and become as little children again, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you start again, become that trusted, open, surrendered being, the energy can't come in, that is the kingdom of heaven. The energy, it is the same thing, cosmic consciousness. Consciousness equals energy, love, awareness, light, wisdom, beauty, truth, purity. It's all the same trip. It's all the same. Any trip you want to take leads to the same place. Purify enough. Become immerse. Beauty. Become it. The potter becomes the pot. Embrace the 10,000 beautiful visions. Become one with the universe. All the energy passes through you. You are all the energy, and it all resides in your heart. If you can go within to your spiritual heart, you will know that you are He. And it is from this place in our heart cave where we are now, we watch the entire drama that is our lives. We watch the illusion with unbearable compassion. There is writing happening. Maybe that's hard for you to understand. I am here, but I am not here. I am writing, but I am not writing. Inside of me, in the heart cave, is a mantra going on that reminds me who I really am over and over again. In this inner place, I am. And even as I write where this mantra is going on, I'm just watching with great awe and wonder the awesome drama of nature unfold before my very eye, before that I, I, which sees all and knows all. And on and on inside goes, Om Mani Padme Om. Always bring me right to my heart where I dwell eternally. When you have quieted your mind enough and transcended your ego enough, you can hear how it really is. So, when you are with a candle flame, you are the candle flame. And when you are with another being's mind, you are the other being's mind. When there is a task to do, you are the task. The mindless quality of total involvement that comes only when the ego is quiet and there is no attachment. It is only when you reside quietly in your own heart that you become he of total light, unbearable compassion, infinite power. See, if you get far enough in, you can see karma, you can see patterns unfolding, of which this life is only a part part of a mosaic. But in order to do that, you have to have left the gravitational field of time and space as a matrix. You can't think in time and space. You can't be in your thoughts anymore because your thoughts are still in time and space and you can't get out of time through them. You've got to be outside that. You've got to be in the place where you see your own conception, birth, childhood, adolescence, maturity, age, death. And not only that one, but that one, that too, that one, and the butterfly. I am without form, without limit, beyond space, Beyond time, I am in everything 
Everything is me. I am the bliss of the universe. Everything am I. But you're still only seeing hints. You've got a way to go yet. Beyond even conceiving of a place. Beyond which you can go beyond. Who's adventurous enough to want to go on that journey? Do you realize when you go on that journey, in order to get to the destination, you can never get to the destination in the process? You must die. Must die. Pretty fierce journey, pretty fierce requirement. We want volunteers. Now, we'll make the journey as comfortable as possible, but you have to realize that after you pass through the Van Allen belt, you're going to get out to another belt of radiation, which is going to crisp you completely and you will die. But there will be an essence left that will get through. Now, who would like to volunteer? Ready? Well, couldn't we make a specially insulated suit? No, sorry, can't do it. But if you propel hard enough, there will be going through. There will be something that will get through to the other side. We can't really define what you'll be. But you'll be beyond that. Why would anyone want to go on a trip like that? Adventure? Well, the one thing about adventure is the adventurer wants to stay around an adventure. If he's going to be crisped in the process, there's going to be no adventurer left to have had the adventure. But you see, there's something that pulls a person towards this journey. Way, way back deep inside is a memory. There is something inside each of us that comes from behind that veil, behind the place of our own birth. It's as if you have tasted of something somewhere in your past that's been so high, so much light, so much energy, that nothing you experience through any of your senses or your thoughts can be enough. Somewhere inside, everybody knows that there is a place which is totally fulfilling, not a desperate flick of fulfillment, it is a state of fulfillment. You may experience despair, that you'll ever know that, good, because through the despair and through that surrender, you get closer to it. And what keeps you from that place? that gives you that total feeling and experience and knowing of fulfillment is all of this posturing, all of your thoughts, all your way of organizing your world, all of your plans, all of your games, your exploring. Some of us do go on this journey. We didn't stand up and say we volunteer. It didn't work that way at all. It's not like you had a choice of volunteering or not volunteering. That isn't the way it works. It's as if you're propelled into it, like the moth into the flame, but yet nobody's pushing you. Nobody's standing around saying, get in, take every third man he goes. It doesn't work that way either. It's a little more like the image of a caterpillar enclosing itself in a cocoon in order to go through the metamorphosis to emerge as a butterfly. The caterpillar doesn't say, well now, I'm going to climb into this cocoon and come out a beautiful butterfly. It's just an inevitable process. It's inevitable. It's just happening. It's got to happen that way. We're talking about a metamorphosis. We're talking about going from a caterpillar to a butterfly. We're talking about how to become a butterfly. I mean, the caterpillar isn't walking around saying, Man, I'll soon be a butterfly, because as long as he's busy being a caterpillar, he can't be a butterfly. It's only when the caterpillarness is done and that one starts to be a butterfly. And that again is part of this paradox. You cannot rip away caterpillarness. The whole trip occurs in an unfolding process under which you have no control. 
Well, what am I doing here if I have no control? That's a hard one. You mean, I don't have any choice? Can't I say this is nonsense? Your lecture changed my whole life. Can't I say this is important? You think that's a choice? No, not at all. It's an unfolding process. If you could stand back far enough and watch the whole process, you would see you are a totally determined being. The very moment you will wake up is totally determined how long you will sleep, is totally determined what you will hear of what I say, is totally determined there are no accidents in this business at all. Accidents are just from where you're looking. To the ego, it looks like it's miracles and accidents. No miracles, no accidents. It's just your vantage point that you're sort of stuck in. This whole trip I'm talking about is fraught with paradox. The most exquisite paradox, as soon as you give it all up, you can have it all. How about that one? As long as you want power, you can't have it. The minute you don't want power, you'll have more than you ever dreamed possible. What a weird thing. As long as you have an ego, you're on a limited trip. You're on a trivial trip that's going to last maybe, what, 60, say, 70, maybe 80 years, and full with fear of its end, trying to make its own eternity? Well, if I'm not speaking, if I am not what I thought I was, how did I I get into this who am I. For only when I know who I am will I know what is possible. Understanding the possibility. There are three ways in which one knows what we are talking about tonight. One way in which you know about it is through direct experience. Through some way or another, through being alone in the desert, through falling in love, through bearing a child, through nearly dying, through turning on, through yoga, through taking any one of your senses and pushing it beyond itself. Going through it, you have touched a place inside yourself that has an intuitive validity. I've been with literally now well over a hundred people who have had such an experience which was powerful and valid but it was so discontinuous with their normal consciousness that they screamed for help. The help that was available to them was a group of minds which said, that's all right, you've just gone crazy. That is, the experience you've just had is the experience of psychosis. William James said, our normal waking consciousness is but one special type of consciousness, whilst all about it, parted from it by the filmiest of screams, there lie potential forms of consciousness entirely different. We may go through life without suspecting their existence, but apply the requisite stimulus, and at a touch, they are there in all their completeness. Definite types of mentality, which probably somewhere have their field of application and adaptation. No account of the universe in its totality can be final, which leaves these other forms of consciousness quite disregarded. How to regard them is the question, for they are so discontinuous with ordinary consciousness. They may determine attitudes, though they cannot furnish formulas and open a religion through they fail to give a map. At any rate, concludes James, they forbid our premature closing of accounts with reality. In spite of what he said, we've closed our accounts with reality. Most of us. That experience you had is psychotic. I'll give you Thorazine. It's not valid. You're hallucinating. What do you mean, you're God? The understanding of this possibility may have come to you directly through the experience itself, or it may have come to you through inference, through your intellect. 
You may have reasoned and reasoned until you saw the peculiar position that rational man is in, and you realize that there must be something else, although you have not experienced it. You just infer the presence of something else. It doesn't quite make sense. Nothing turns you on. You haven't experienced it directly, but you figured there must be something else, something there. And then you read all the writings of St. John of the Cross and St. Teresa Avila and on and on and all the mystics and visionaries and recorded history. And you say, well, they can't all be nuts. They must be talking about something. So you sort of infer the presence of this other thing, but you don't know it in your guts. Now that's a tough one to be in that position. Then the third way is, you trust the fact that there are realized beings. And they said it, and therefore you know it to be true. It's not inference anymore. It's not an intellectual process. You just accept what they have said. That's faith. See, we've gotten so super sophisticated in our evaluative mechanisms that you question everything you hear. How do you know you're not being hustled? I mean, what was Jesus up to? What's the game, man? What's he into? And you especially feel paranoid if you're one of the keepers of the tables in the temple. If you are committed to an existing system with great attachment, with great attachment, somewhere or another, most of you in this room, most of you, not all of you, most of you have sensed the possibility, but you can't quite... Surrender. What are you giving up? A hollow little trip that's good for another 40 years at best. You're giving it up for eternal union, pure energy, and pure light. Because surrender means you no longer die. It's as simple as that. And that's what it means because you that lives and dies is you. It's ego. And fear of death only comes from the brittleness of the ego. Total surrender, total surrender. There's no more you, no more life and death. Yeah, I'm going to die, wow, dig that. I'm going to live, wow, dig that. Garbage, wow, new blossoms on the tree, wow. Patterns of energy, all patterns of energy. You're part of it all, that's the place. So my father says to me, when are you going back to India? And I say, I'm going back when the guru says I am to come back in two years. So my father says, do you do everything he says? Don't you have a mind of your own? We're giving you this exquisite position in this company and we want you to know you'll have a great deal of independent decision-making power. What do you want to do today, Marty? I don't care. What do you want to do? I remember a few days staying in London. We had fled from Copenhagen where we had had a very unfortunate scene at a psychological convention. We were in London and Tim and Bill Burroughs and I were walking down the street, high on something or other, and we were spending days going from park to tea room to park to tea room, and every now and then we'd hit a corner and somebody would say, well, should we cross the street? And we'd stand there and nobody would seem to care because we were all fulfilled at that moment. Right there on the street corner in London, we were all just very, very high. You don't have to have that urge, that desire, that unfulfilled thing. Just let it be. Just be, 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 be more, more, more. What's holding you back? Your thoughts? Huh? You've got to give them up. Just ego planning. What are you doing? Planning for the future? Well, it's all right now. But later? Forget it, baby. That's later. Now is now. Are you going to be here or not? It's as simple as that. But I'm so young. I have so many things to do yet. Well, 
That'll sure keep you from being here and now. Life is passing me by. Hmm, but if I live just in the here and now, won't there be chaos? What happens if the telephone rings? Well, the here and now is the fact that the telephone is ringing. Pick it up. Well, what if somebody wants to make an appointment to see me three weeks from now? Right, write it down. That's here and now. Well, what happens three weeks from now? Three weeks from now, there's that appointment. And then that is here and now. When your child comes down the stairs, this is the first moment all over again. This is Buddha meeting Buddha. Over toast and coffee, over milk and porridge, over moo tea and brown rice. We never had breakfast before. This is it. This is all there is right now. It is not good enough, man. It's not good enough. Now, about five years ago, I'm living in this community in California with a very, very beautiful high being, Steve Durkee, a visionary artist, a very beautiful guy. His wife and child and I'd have a day off and it would be a Saturday and we'd go to the store, the dog, the babies, we'd all get into the Volkswagen microbus. There'd be Jane, the gal I was living with and her baby and me and Steve and Barbara and the whole scene going shopping. We'd get to the door and Dakota, Kobe, Steve's daughter, would start to cry. Well now, we gotta get to the store. I have Saturday mornings free and Saturdays we shop. All right, Kobe, cool it. Kobe doesn't cool it, she cries. Well, maybe we'll go to the store with Kobe crying or no, Kobe doesn't like that, she cries louder. Maybe Barbara had better stay home with Kobe. Let's go, come on. Are we going or aren't we? What's wrong with Kobe? She's just being a kid. Steve says, what's the use of going to the store? It's like price efficiency. What happened to the vibrations? What happened to the human beings in that shuffle? So we would do this absurd thing. We'd all stop and gather. We'd all sit down and join hands around this little kid. We'd cool ourselves out. Kobe would stop crying. Then we'd go to the store. And Steve taught me that. If you get so efficient, if you got to turn off all the vibrations of the scene because you're so busy about the future or the past or time has caught you, it costs too much. One, two, me. And you finally understand the message you communicate with another human being has nothing to do with what you say. It has nothing to do with the look of the musculature of your face. It's much deeper than that, much deeper. It's the vibrations that emanate from you. If your vibrations are paranoid, that's what's being received. And when you're around pets, birds or cats particularly, or even young children or very flipped out psychotics, they will know you immediately. You can come and say, hello dear, how are you? And the dog will growl. You can't come on because they're listening to the vibrations that hand is reaching out and sending. And you realize that every moment you are a full statement of your being and you're sending out vibrations that are affecting everything around you which in turn is affecting everything that comes back. And when you meet someone who is caught in the world of we and them, and you are him, to that person, and you get caught in his mind net, you are both just intensifying one another's paranoia. Hippies create police, police create hippies. If you're in polarity, you're creating polar opposites. You can only protest effectively when you love the person whose ideas you are protesting against as much as you love yourself. 
Love has to spring spontaneously from within, and it is in no way amendable to any form of inner or outer force. Love and coercion can never go together, but though love cannot be forced on anyone, it can be awakened in him through love itself. Love is essentially self-communicative. Those who do not have it catch it from those who have it. True love is unconquerable and irresistible, and it goes on gathering power and spreading itself until eventually it transforms everyone whom it touches. And the fact of the matter is, as you go out on the astral plane, you see more and more, and the final thing you see in the world of form before you go into the formless and into total unity, you see the world of yin and yang. And the world of yin and yang is another astral plane, and it's on one of the highest planes in the world of form, but it's still duality. It is still polarization. There is God, there is man, there is good, there is evil, yes, no, pleasure, pain, loss, gain. The world most everybody is living in most of the time. The only way out of that is to take the poles of every set of opposites and see the way in which they are one. And if you can get into that place where you see the interrelatedness of everything and you see the oneness in it all, then no longer are you attached to your polarized position. The whole thing about generation gaps is a hype. The spirit is the spirit. When you can center and see your whole life as a story in which chapters are unfolding, then the moment-to-moment -moment ego involvement, am I getting enough at this moment, ceases to be a dominant theme, and you start to live in the Tao, the way. Jesus said, I am the way. It's the same way. The way is the way is the way. The way is the harmony of the universe. When one comes into the spirit, when one sees how it is, one understands that behind all the individual differences, man, woman, big, little, old, young, good, bad, Every label you can think of becomes background instead of the figure. What stands out is, here we are, here and now, and that's all there is. And if it isn't beautiful, man, there's nothing. So you say, well, I can't have it beautiful now, but later, when we get the food home, it will be beautiful. Later never exists. What's happened to life insurance, to tenure, to planning, saving, responsibilities? Nothing's happened to any of it. Surfing. Either you do it like it's a big weight on you, or you do it as part of the dance. When you understand the thought is the thought of the thoughtless, your singing and dancing is no other than the voice of the Dharma. Akuin. Singing and dancing and insurance and savings accounts and job and responsibility. Shiva's dance of life. Do you do it from uh or do you do it from ah? Do you surf through it all or do you carry it around like a load? If only you could throw it off. If only I didn't have these kids around my neck. You can't get away for the day because it's in your head that you're trying to get away from and the only way to get away is to change your head. Simple as that. You want to change your environment? Change your head. It's all the ecstatic moment if you know how to dig it. If not, it's a travesty. That's all profane. Desire. The first thing in my teacher's book, the first thing he ever wrote on his slate, because he was silent, was, desire is a trap. Desirelessness is moksha. Desire is the creator. Desire is the destroyer. 
Desire is the universe. And that applies to the physical plane, the astral plane, the casual plane, heaven, demons, hell, the demons on 43rd Street, as well as the demons on the astral plane, are all creations of desire. All the manifestations of the Divine Mother are creations of desire. That's why Naga, the naked ascetic, worked on getting Rama Krishna to go beyond his love for Kali. Give up even the desire to be experiencing the bliss of being at all, of being with the Divine Mother. The Buddhists say, I'm talking about the non-dualistic Buddhists, cut out all that middle stuff. They say, don't get hung up on all these different desire trips. Just go beyond it all. Buddha's Four Noble Truths are very straightforward and very simple. The first one concerns the fact that life always has in it the element of unfulfillment. Call it suffering, birth, old age, sickness, not getting what you want, getting what you don't want, even getting what you want in this physical world is going to be suffering because you're going to lose it. It's always in time. Anything that's in time is going to pass away. Lay not up your treasures where moth and rust doth corrupt. That's the trap of time. As long as you want anything in time, it's going to pass because time passes. The second noble truth is the cause of suffering is desire or craving. If you don't try to hold, you don't suffer over the loss. If you don't worship life, you don't fear death. But if you try to hold on to life, it's very sad. You can honor life, but if you try to hold on to life, it's very sad. Did you ever see a really beautiful woman like a top model who is just getting to that point where her looks are changing into what could be an eternal beauty if she hadn't been so busy with her external beauty? She is caught in the beauty of time, which withers, and yet, how poignant. Well, we've all touched people who are so beautiful as beings that we never noticed whether they are physically beautiful. It's like an eternal beauty lives within them. Well, if you attach yourself, if you crave temporal things, beauty, possessions, achievement, anything, how poignant. Example, somebody looks at you seductively, an ice cream cone goes by. Will it ever be the big ice cream cone in the sky? Will it ever be an eternal ice cream cone, or is it always going to melt? You gotta keep eating it, yet it melts and melts. That's its problem. You gotta keep eating it, cause it will melt. And then it's gone. And you know that taste in your mouth when you finish and you want a glass of water, right? Then you have a glass of water and there's that bloaty feeling. Then you're ready for the next one, to get rid of that one. Let's take a walk, and you take a walk. It's cold out, let's have some hot chocolate. Yes, let's have some, and on and on and on. It's called life. You see, the opposite of craving is saying, baby, this is the way it is. Yeah, okay, here and now, this is it. I accept the here and now fully, as it is right at this moment. Lame, halt, blind, dying, we're all dying. At this moment, your body is disintegrating before your very eyes. If you've taken LSD, you may be seeing it do this, but you know, it's happening anyway. It's all a downhill trip all the way. Boy, what a funny place to get attached to something that's gotta go like that. So Buddha says, the cause of suffering is attachment or desire. They all say the same thing. Third noble truth, give up attachment, give up desire. You end the births, you end the deaths, you end the suffering. You end the whole thing that keeps you stuck. If I am not attached to this particular time-space locus, then I can free my awareness from my body and I can become one with it all. I can merge with the Divine Mother. 
Fourth noble truth is the Eightfold Path for getting rid of desire, which says, get your life straight, do your work, do everything you've got to do, watch your speech, watch your thought, watch your calmness, get your calm center going, live your life in such a way as to get yourself straight, to get free of attachment that just keeps sucking you in all the time. Get free of desire. Get free of desire. It's a little like a roller coaster. This is the way it works. If you read St. John of the Cross, Dark Night of the Soul, you know how it is. You've really been working on yourself and you're very pure and something high happens to you and you feel liberated. And then your ego walks around and pats you on the shoulder. Pretty good. Look how holy you're becoming. And you fall again. That's one of the traps. In fact, the higher you get, the harder you fall. Each time, it's those fierce lions guarding the inner gates. All this stuff happens when you are extricating yourself from the web of desire, which is your ego, which is your cognitive framework of the universe. It's all the same thing. And this extrication, believe me, doesn't happen without an internal struggle. This is called tapas, tapasia, straightening by fire. If a man gives way to all his desires or ponders to them, there will no inner struggle in him, no friction, no fire. But if for the sake of attaining a definite aim, he struggles with the desires that hinder him, he will then create a fire which will gradually transform his inner world into a single whole Auspensky, in search of the miraculous. Faith, had ye but faith, you could move mountains, said Jesus. And that is literally true. The Bible is not a metaphor. It's not a story made up to teach us how to be moral beings. It's a straight message of how it is when man lives in the spirit, and the spirit is right inside. The way to get into the spirit is not a lot of hocus pocus. It's a very simple, methodical, mechanical set of steps, but they're only available to him who can hear. Let those who have ears hear. Teach not him who does not want to know. The whole game is based on faith. What you may not understand is, the whole game you've been playing is also based on faith. You have had faith in the rational mind. We are living in a society which is a temple dedicated to the rational man. Even though the first commandment says, I, the Lord thy God, thou shall not have no other gods before me. Even though that has been said, and even though we repeat it, we still worship the rational mind and its products. We worship our own sense data it's only when we see the assumptions that we've already been functioning on that we can start to extricate ourselves. We've got to have heard the first message before any of the keys open anything. You don't even know there are doors until you have heard the first message. Georges I. Gurdjieff, a Westerner who went on the higher trip, or at least a large part of the trip, said, you don't seem to understand. You are in prison. If you are to get out of prison, the first thing you must realize is you are in prison. If you think you're free, you can't escape. What calming the mind is all about, what meditation is for, is to cool you out so you remember. So you see how it all is. Try sitting around when you're full of self-pity. You sit down in front of your puja table and you take a picture of Meher Baba and he's smiling at you like there's the other Marx brother and he's saying, let me help you. Oh, I wish you would, Baba. It's so hard. Wow, dig that self-pity. Isn't that exquisite? Full bloom. What an extraordinary color. It must be a new brand of self-pity a particularly fragrant variety. I just really want to smell that one, to sit and smell it forever so long. 
Such a good one. I mean, I wish I could have time to groove with you, but I've got to get on with life. I have important things to do today. All right, Baba. I'll sit with you for one minute, okay? Here we are. You've got one minute. Do your thing. 40 seconds left. Said Hana. You've got to be quiet inside to do that kind of photography. It's very easy to photograph inanimate objects like other people, but turn the lens right in on the very stuff you're hiding in, shoot the camera this way, very powerful stuff. So all I can do all the time is to cool myself out. That's all I'm doing. I do nothing but Sedana. If somebody says, what do you do, man? I say, I do Sedana. Sure, but don't you lecture? Sure, lecturing happens, but I'm doing my Sedana. The trip is helping me get free of my ego because if I get free of my ego, we all get free of our ego because that's the way the trip works because we're all the same being and that's the problem. We can only move as fast as we can all move. You can hear this message only as purely as I am pure. That's the way it boils down. I can resonate with you in the highest place. I am. So I can do nothing for you but work on myself. You can do nothing for me but work on yourself. Oh, I'm going to do good things for my child. Baloney. That's all ego. Just work on yourself. And every time you work on yourself, you get calmer, you hear more, you sense more, you are more, you're more present. What are you offering a child? Not a set of social roles, passing in the night. You're offering a child here and nowness. The treasure of consciousness, the treasure of awareness. If you don't help other beings cut through the illusion because you're through the illusion, what else? What else is there? What are you doing? Doing more of the dance within the dance? Are we always going to meet on the stage? Don't we ever take off the costumes? That's what I felt as a child. We are always on the stage in our costumes. I know to play good child. I've been in that role for years. I know how to do that. Don't talk back, go to bed early, don't get your knees dirty, eat all the food on your plate. I'm a master at that game. Is anybody home? Hello, I'm home. Is anybody home? Sure, I'll have some food. If I give you the external things, I'm a good parent. You and I can always starve together if we're backstage in the here and now. If we're not in the here and now, no matter how much food we put in our bellies, it's never going to be enough. And that's the feeling of the Western man. It's not enough. He's got it all going in as fast as he can shovel it. He's got every sensual gratification he can possibly desire. And it's not enough because there's no here and now-ness about it. Here and now is the doorway to all that energy. Because if you're truthfully here and now, there's no more you. That's the way it works. Did you ever go to the movies and get so caught up in the movie that you forgot who you were and then the lights come on and you wondered, where am I? What's going on? Oh, it's a movie. What you've got to do is create in yourself an absolutely calm center where it's always right here and now. It is just light. It is just isness. It is just getting into the tub, eating, going to the toilet, up the stairs, getting into bed, running down the street, talking. Just the isness. When you meet a being who is centered, you always know it. You always feel a kind of calm emanation. It always touches you in that place you, where you feel calm. But you can't hustle it. You can't make believe you're calm when you're not. It never works. Everybody knows you know it's horrible. You must center. Find that place inside yourself. And whatever your dance is, you're doing it from that place. Always right in here, right in your heart.
the subtle mother. And every time you step back, one step from your own melodrama, the cosmic humor gets higher and higher. The absurdity of it all, the extreme beauty of it all, the Divine Mother, which is nature, which is you, which is all of this, which is the whole physical plane. All you can do is honor her and love her and she becomes so exquisite and she's pulling you and that's really something because if you say wow lady I know who you are you're the keeper of this reform school that's attachment can't have her can't reject her can't live with her can't put her away just honor and honor her divine mother you've got to worship her She is the veil, and at some point, she is Sita. Sita stands aside on the jungle path so Ram's brother can see Ram. Ram is God. Sita is Ram's wife, and Laksaman is Ram's brother. And they're going along a jungle path, and it is God who is Ram, and Sita behind him, and then the brother. Laksaman. And Laksaman can't see his brother, who is God, because of this woman, Sita, who walks between them. And every now and then, she just moves just a little to one side so Laksaman can see God. Divine Mother Callie. She is my mother, she is my moon, she is my father, she is my child, she is my brother, she is the grass, she is my lover, she is the dew, she is my son. Look at how much she can teach, her tongue dripping blood, a circle of skulls around her neck, a dagger in one hand, giving birth in the other, the whole process of nature. How exquisitely subtle. Remember Siddhartha, his journey and the amount of time he spent in the Garden of Pleasure with the woman who had much to teach? She always had a new thing to teach. She will always have a new thing to teach. Always. Can anyone imagine that a woman as full and seductive as that is not going to teach something? is not going to continue to teach something. If you think that something's happening, like you're working, you're achieving, you're doing something worthwhile, there is much to do. All of that is just a pendant in the ear of the Divine Mother. Or it's a little spot of color on her cheek. Or it's a little bell on her toe. And when you meet a lover like that, sure you'll want to hang around and experience it. As long as we're greedy for experience, we're going to be around for quite a while. We're not going to elect to go on the crisp trip because that's the end of the experiencer. Her other face is the one you're trying to see. If she is the entire illusion, she is also that which is beyond illusion. And so finally, when you have gone beyond her and become free of her, and you go to beyond the beyond, and you finally cross the great ocean of existence, and you stand on the other side, and you're completely free, who's there? The Divine Mother welcoming you. That's the Bodhisattva part of it. Have you gone and have you gotten the liberation? And then you are, right here, chopping wood and carrying water. Making it sacred. This chopping wood and carrying water is karma yoga, the yoga of daily life. The way to do it is, do what you do 
but dedicate the fruits of the work to me. That's the most esoteric way of saying it. Another way of saying it is, do it without attachment. Another way of saying it is, total renunciation. Now that doesn't mean you go up to a mountain and live in a cave. It means that you renounce attachment even to your own desires. It means you do what you do because that's what the harmony of the universe requires. If I am a potter, I make pots. But who is making the pots? I am not under the illusion that I am making the pots. Pots are. The potter is. I am a hollow bamboo. I am a doctor, a student, a dropout, all the same game. Don't let that offend you, but the external world is all the same. It's all the external world. People often say to me, I would really like to do sadhana, but I'm a teacher now. If I could only finish being a teacher, I could do sadhana. Baloney. You're either doing sadhana or you're not. Sadhana is a full-time thing that you do because there is nothing else to do. You do it whether you're teaching or sitting in a monastery, whether you're lying in bed, going to the toilet, making love, eating. Everything is a part of waking up. Everything is done without attachment. Another way of saying it is, it's all done as a consecrated action. It's all dedicated. It's all sacred. In the old days, like many of you, I suppose I was a good oral type person. You open the refrigerator and you can't stuff your mouth fast enough. Everything turns you on. The stimulus arouses the response. Here's a real sour pickle. Mmm, I'll have a little of that. And there's some ice cream. There's some coleslaw. That'll go good with the ice cream. Oh boy, it's too much. Have a taste of flour. You can go on the oral trip about everything. I come right out of that tradition. I want you to know where I started from. From what depths? What depths? When I was an adolescent, I was so fat that all of my clothes had to be specially made. We could go into a store and my mother would say, he wants to see the double Z with balloon seats. It took me at least $10,000 of my analysis to get rid of that one, I'll tell you, so you can understand that I speak of the oral trip with a certain amount of empathy. And now suddenly comes this new ruling sent down from above. All your acts will be consecrated. All your acts will be consecrated. Wow, that's great, but what about food? Ah, now in the West we have a thing you see, the Norman Rockwell cover, Thanksgiving Day. There's the turkey, and everybody has his eyes closed saying grace, and the kid's hand is already on the turkey. Okay, let's say grace and eat quick. So in India, I was taught this thing to say to consecrate the food, and it was very funny. I'd been taught it but I still had this old orality business. So I would say it, but I could not think it. And I could not stop long enough to experience it. At least I had to confront myself and see where I wasn't. You've got to go at the rate you can go. You wake up at the rate you wake up. You're finished with your desires at the rate you finish with your desires. The disequilibrium comes into harmony at the rate it comes into harmony. You can't rip the skin off the snake. The snake must molt the skin. That's the rate it happens. You'll meet another person and there are qualities in that person which offend you and there are qualities which attract you. Some qualities seduce you. Some qualities repel you. Some qualities sexually excite you. Some qualities revolt you. Some qualities interest you. Some qualities fascinate you. Some qualities bore you. 
It's only when you can see through all that veil, through all your own desires, beyond Sita walking in the path, that you can see beyond all that, to where the other being is. You will do that when you've gone inside to see where you are. Beyond the things in which attract you, and seduce you, and excite you, and repel you, the journey across the great ocean of existence is a journey inward, ever in deeper and deeper, and the deeper you get in, the more you meet truth. The Guru It's hard to speak in words about the Guru, to speak of the difference between an Upa Guru and a Sat Guru. It's interesting when I tell the story of my journey in India, and I tell of the Guru. I always speak of his miracles, although from my point of view, they are not the essence of the matter at all, but they are that which is speakable of. It's a little like that Persian story where Nas Rudin is looking for his house key under the street lamp and others come to help him and finally they ask him, where did you lose it? And he answers, in my house, but it's dark in there and since it's light out here, this is the best place to look. I find myself talking about things that are talkable about, what can I say? Can I say, with any meaning, that when I'm with the guru, there's nobody home? Or that I love him so thoroughly that I would do anything he would ever ask of me, and the highest thing I could think of is being at his feet, and at the same moment, I don't care if I never see him again in this life. Can I say that? Can I say there is absolutely nothing special about him? He's just a little old man with a blanket. Can I say he's right here now? Which one are you ready to hear? When I was around Maharaji, there was always a constant stream of devotees who had much reverence, but not too much faith. And they were always asking Maharaji for miracles or to get them a job, or they wanted to use his divinatory powers and tell them about the future. And then when he would ask me what I wanted, I couldn't think of anything. I just felt he was inside of me. How do you ask your inner self for something? You are already it. What is it that you could give to yourself? Give yourself presence? It's all wrong. At first, I didn't trust it. So I'd have to come into his presence and the minute I'd get there, I'd feel, yeah, and then I'd look at him and my eyes would get all swimming with tears and I'd just launch and I'd feel silly. I would really be silly. It's hard to get me speechless. My teacher, Hari Das Baba, is essence. He is pure. He is just like a crystal. He is, he is beautiful. He, ex he is exquisitely articulated. He taught me everything I was ready to learn. The guru taught me nothing in form. He never explained anything. He'd laugh at me and twirl my hair, and he'd hand me an orange and say things like, you make many people laugh in America? And I'd say, yes. And he'd say, that's good. That doesn't teach you much. That's just hanging out. The teacher, on the other hand, was all spit and polish, all business. He is a pure Brahmin, and he has work to do, and he is going to teach me, and it was all no nonsense. He would be making me a rope to go around my waist with seven strands, and he would be explaining each strand. I would honor him and love him and wish to serve him. One of them is in the world for me, and one of them is not. The relationship to the guru has nothing to do with the worldliness, with the worldly. By guru, I don't mean a specific guru. In my head, there is a universal guru, a level of consciousness, a frequency of vibration, a connection to another plane. He was right here, 
laughing, and being here all the time. I spent all last winter and the year before at the temple, just making love to Maharaji, in every way being opened wider and was just so awed by the pure love of a being that there was no place for my paranoia anywhere. I turned, there it was, and no place for it because I only saw the man probably eight times. It's amazing and all, but two times for not more than half an hour or maybe an hour, and most of that was supperless. I needed to see him in the flesh only because my faith was not pure enough. What awesome is the people who have been sharing this journey with me these past few years who have, because of their purity, made direct contact with the guru in themselves through the purity of their love. Jesus said, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. The way bhakti works, you just love until you and the beloved become one. I've reflected on the difference between a teacher and the guru. The guru is the way. The closer you come to the Tao, to the way, the inner place, the Atman, into this perfect center, to going into samadhi, the closer you come to making contact with the guru. It's as if the guru is an airplane hovering over a landing field and there's just too much ground traffic for the plane to land. Cars all over the runway looking for a guru. He just circles and circles doing a holding pattern waiting for you to clear your runway so he can land. He's sitting up there in here all the time. Maharaji is not further away from you at this moment than the thought you're thinking now, and if you were capable of completely stopping this thought, or transcending it, or being centered from the inside behind it, he and you would then be one. You dig that my special relationship to him, if indeed he is living in Satchi Ananda, cannot conceivably be special. There's no meaning to that. Specialness can only be in each person's karma. It's not an interpersonal relationship with a being that is not interpersonal. People say, you've got something going with the guru. That's absurd. I just have what I have going with my own karma. Each person is as close to the guru at every moment as he is close to the guru at that moment. And people say, maybe the guru would intervene and take on my karma. But from a guru's point of view, he just understands how it all is in an eternal time and space. He has no attachment either to life or death. And if he takes on your karma, it is your karma that he should take on your karma. Simple as that. You see, you are the guru. That's what's so far out. You are your own guru. I am my own grandpa. And that's what you finally know when you are hanging out with one of these guys. You hang out with yourself. Because there's nobody at home there at all. So to the extent that they're hanging out in the interpersonal sense, all you can be seeing are your own desires. He is a perfect mirror since there's nobody here. The chicken sees. When I met my guru who knew everything in my head, I realized that he knew everything in my head whether I liked it or not. He knew it. And there would be times after a particularly beautiful darshan with him and he'd say to me, 
oh, you gave much money to a llama. And I'd say, yes. And he'd say, you're very good. You're coming along with your sadhana. And I felt so good. And then I'd go back to the temple and think, boy, I'm going to be a great yogi. I'll have great powers. What am I going to do with them? And I'd start to have these horrible thoughts and all my impurities would rise to the surface. And they would really be, and then I'd go to bed and have all kinds of sexual fantasies. And I'd think, look, you're being a yogi and you see the absurdity of that situation you're in, but I'd still have the thought. And then in the course of it, I'd have a thought, I'd be going through my shoulder bag and come across a note I'd written to myself, remember to visit Lama Gomvita. And I'd think, I must visit Lama Gomvita while I'm in India. And the next morning at eight o'clock, there is the messenger with instructions. The guru said you're to go visit Lama Govinda. Now, there isn't a message saying cut out those sexual thoughts, but he must obviously know them. Do you think he just picked up on the Lama Govinda thing? Can I assume the probabilities are he only tunes in every time I have a positive thought? And then I come before him and now I'm freaked because I know he knows it all. And I walk in and he looks at me with total love. And I think, how can he do that? This guy must be nuts. He's loving this corrupt. Why isn't he? You see the predicament I was in? And then what I understood was he was loving that in me which was behind my personality and behind my body. Not I really love Ram Das. It wasn't interpersonal love. It wasn't possessive love. It wasn't needful love. It was the fact that he is love. Where he saw me, he looked at me, and he saw that place in me, which is love. And here we are in love. And that's the world he lives in. And once I appreciated that, and I could see that he could look at this corrupt, impure, ugly being, and he could love it that much, nobody had ever done that before. Everybody had said, I'll love you if, and he just said, where you really are, and where I really am, we are love. And when I was around him, I was in love. Now, once I had tasted of that universe, where we were all us, this place, that's the sea of love. Boy, I'm going to live in it. I'm going to be it. I'm going to submerge myself in it. You got to protect yourself from what? Love? Once you know there's no place to hide, then, anyway, you wonder, who are you hiding from? There's a Sikh story about a holy man who gave too many to chicken and said, go kill them where no one can see. One guy went behind the fence and killed the chicken. The other guy walked around for two days and came back with the chicken. The holy man said, you didn't kill the chicken? The guy said, well, everywhere I go, the chicken sees. Sahaj Samadhi. The guru is on an endless wave, just hanging out in that place. He's hanging, where does he reside? He resides in this really interesting place. He resides right in that place where the divine mother merges into herself. He's right between the two sides of the coin. He's right at that place. He's going into one with it all, into the void, and he comes back into form in order to love it all, and then through his love, he goes back into it again. It's like making love to somebody and you pick your face up from your lover in order to come down and to experience. Aren't we having a ball? And then you go back into oneness. Such a Zen being does that with every breath, between each breath, one and then the breath of two. He is eternally in that place. He's in what is known as Sahaj Samadhi. He's right at the edge. He stays at that edge. And that's why he stays in his body. If he just stayed in the void, the body, 
after 21 days just falls away. There's no ego left to hold it together. That's the rule of the game. If you're wondering what happens, some beings do that. They go into Samadhi and they've finished with their bodies and they just leave them. And then there are others. There are some very far out stories in India. There are others who leave a thin, very, very thin thread of ego. There's one being who for 20 years was locked up in a cave. And every year his devotees open the cave. Once a year they go in to have his darshan. There was no food, nothing. And he looked like a corpse, except that his hair kept growing and his nails kept growing. For 20 years, he was not hanging out with much. He was leaving a subtle thread to keep in contact. Those of little faith need long fingernails and long hair to believe it's happening. Lest ye see miracles, ye will not believe, said our buddy. Everything he said was straight. You understand, all that stuff in the Bible is really straight. Look what happened to the Saul of Tarsus, for God's sake. There he was, riding along in the desert on his horse or camel or something, and a voice said to him, Why are you persecuting me? He was out in the hot sun, and you know, he flipped out, and he went flying off his horse and fell on the ground. What do you want of me? Start my church. Go to the next town and you'll be instructed. That's what he heard and he went the whole trip. And that's an astral trip. A very groovy astral trip. That's what the Bible is. An astral story. A very groovy astral story. At one level, I can feel the horror in somebody saying, he's saying, he's saying, it's a good astral story, but illusions are illusions. It's here, in the sound of the tambora, in the beginning was, the word. Ready? It's a combination of things that make you ready to see the guru. There are many people who come to see Maharaji and they just see a little old man with a blanket. Can you imagine the horror? This happened to two people who heard me and figured out where the guru must be through logical deduction and went to India and went rushing to his feet and found a little old man in a blanket who threw them out. Imagine what that must feel like because you can see the difference in their minds and what it is they had a model of. The model was what they searched for it was their own thought process which kept them from seeing. Two things are required. One is Varigaya, the falling away of worldliness and the returning of innocence. That means you're starting to have enough of all that. You see that everything you're going to experience through your senses and everything you're going to know through your thinking mind is not going to be enough and worldly things begin to appear, like dross instead of gold. Not totally, just it begins to happen. It's falling away. My teacher said, the veil falls away like the skin of a snake. The ego thins like clouds until only a transparent layer remains. The other thing that's required is the pure seeking, the purity of the faith. There is as much faith in you here in us at this moment, as anywhere in India. Where there is faith, there is the presence of the Guru. He is it all. He is your impurities. He is all your corruption. There he is smiling at you through them, saying, and this too, he sees, he understands, total compassion. Total compassion means you are the universe. You are all form. You are the breath. You are the river. You are the void. You are the desire to be enlightened. You are enlightened.
that's who he is. That's who what a guru is. So any concept you can have of any relation to a guru obviously is a hype. How can you relate to something which is already you and everything you've ever related to or could relate to? How are you going to talk about it? I met him. Who? What? I'm going to look for the guru. How absurd. You are it. It's really just another cop-out to be searching for the guru. He's your fingernail. Just bite your fingernail and you're eating him alive. When you know how to listen, everybody is the guru speaking to you. It's right here, always. Here and now. I keep doing this because I don't think people thoroughly grok the fact that here is where it all is. After you finish the whole thing and you vibrated your spine for years and done your pranayama and meditated for years and years and sat in a cave and ants have eaten your arms and legs, here you are. You're right here again and what blows your mind is you were here all the time and it's such a cosmic joke. It's so funny, your struggles to get here. At this moment, if you set the alarm to get up at 347 this morning, and when the alarm rings and you get up and turn it off and say, what time is it? You'd say, now, now where am I? Here. Then, go back to sleep. Get up at 9 tomorrow. Where am I? Here. What time is it? Now. Try 432 three weeks from next Thursday. By God, it is. There's no getting away from it. That's the way it is. That's the eternal present. You finally figure out that it's only the clock that's going around. It's doing its thing, but you're sitting here, right now, always. Nobody is going anywhere. Nobody is coming from anywhere. We're all here. We're all here in eternal time and space. We're always going to be here. We're just doing Laila Rasa, the divine dance. We're dancing and dancing and dancing, dance after dance in one body, in another body. And we're all here. We're all staying right here. Nothing to do. There is nowhere to go and there is nothing to do. And we're going to keep coming to know one another more and more free of being identified with any veil, we're going to see more and more of other beings less identified with their veils. As you find the light in you, you begin to see the light in everybody else. As you find God in yourself, there is God everywhere. Such a simple, obvious sequence of stuff to do. Somebody says, oh, I try meditating and I can't, and I just, I'm afraid I'm not ready, and I've got to go. Great, sure, man, go ahead. Of course, what else is there to do? Going back into the world, it's called, it's a good step. I'm going back, word, forward? I can't do either of them. I can't go backward, and I can't go forward, and I can't stand still. All of this is irrelevant. We're all just caught in the delusion. All of us caught in the illusion, being aware of it as an illusion, and yet so much in it. If you have ever watched a beautiful Zen monk, and a very old monk who is really there, or here, really here, whichever, you watch him. He's cooking food, he's lifting stones, he's moving. You watch him walk and it's like nobody's walking. The legs are going, and the whole thing is happening, but nothing is happening no matter what is happening. And that's what blows your mind. And when you get out of 
the kinds of heads you've got going that don't allow us to really understand how this can be. Return to the roots. You live out your karma. The best I can tell you about karma is, if you are pure spirit, you are not matter. You are that eternal spirit. Well, in each of us is that very old being, and not this young body or this body that is going through this life. Why don't we remember? Why don't we remember it all? Why can't we read the entire Akashic record? because of our attachments to this physical plane of reality, because of the power of our identification with our body senses and thoughts. If you could go into a meditation room, close up your ears, sit down, center, go in, 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 further in, oh much further in, oh you've just begun, keep going back in, don't linger to the smell of the pretty sunflower, don't linger to hold on to the ecstasy of bliss, keep going in behind the scenes, behind your thoughts, and if you can go back in far enough, you will see everything you've identified with him, you will see your own personality, your own body, your own life drama, it's very awesome. The point is, we have gone out, out, and out, and we have sought and sought and found much, but it hasn't been enough. And now, by merely turning the process inward, you go in and in and in until you come to the place where Guru Rinpoche sits. And what is this place? Hindus call it the Atman. And what is the Atman? The Bhagavadam, one of the holy books of India, says, The Atman, or divine self, is separate from the body. It is one without a second pure, self-luminous, without attributes, free, all-pervading. It is the eternal witness. Blessed is he who knows this Atman, for through an embodied being he shall be free. From the changes and qualities pertaining to the body, he alone is ever united with me. This is the place of pure being, that inner place where you dwell, you just be. There is nothing to be done in that place. From that place then it all happens. It manifests in perfect harmony with the universe, because you are the laws of the universe. You are the laws of the universe. This is what man's journey into consciousness is all about. This Om, home, is going Om. This is the place, becoming one with God, returning. It's the return to the roots that the Tao talks about. It is the stillness, the calmness, the fulfillment. When you make love and experience the ecstasy of unity, that's the place. When you experience a great achievement and you feel a moment of exhilaration, that's the place. When you see a moment of poetry in a flower or in words or in art, the way it is supposed to be, this is the place right here. It's Buddha consciousness. It's Christ consciousness. Jesus says, I and my father are one. When Buddha says, you give up attachment and you finish with the illusion, this is the place. Still, you do your thing, live your life in the world, the water goes on down the stream, and you chop the wood and carry the water, and you do your thing. Your mind does its thing, and your senses their thing. But you, you are not attached, because you sat in front of the candle flame until there was just you and the candle flame. Then finally, you extricated yourself from its attachment to your own thoughts, and in the tyranny of the drunken monkey, even to the thoughts of I and candle flame, not so that you would ever think again. I mean, few people who know me don't appreciate the fact that I think I have keen discernment and I have not lost my mind 
and I am a sophisticated, aware being. And yet, behind every word and behind it all is a mantra going inside my head in which I am sitting, calmly watching this whole drama unfold. My thinking mind is a perfect servant and a lousy master. I am watching he who speaks. I am watching they who listen. I am watching, thinking, thoughts are clouds. The entire process from this place inside is always calm. A place in which the flame never flickers. And as I learn to live in this eternally calm place, it gets deeper and deeper and calmer and calmer and wiser and wiser and lighter and lighter and I am more love and I become more and more like the sun. Just the process of calming, centering, centering, calming, extricating myself from the drama. So long as one feels that he is the doer, he cannot escape from the wheel of births and deaths. This doesn't mean that I am lying in bed doing nothing. That's drama, as much as this book is drama. Drama is drama. Drama is drama. Desire is drama. Breathing is drama. Thought is drama. Emotions are drama. All form is drama. It's all part of the drama. I have no scruple of change, nor fear of death. I was never born, nor had I parents. What does that mean? What it means is, when you clear away all the underbrush, when you go back and back, not for the fun of it, or for the powers involved, but to go back to be who you really are, who you are turns out to be spirit, turns out not to be matter at all. No matter, never mind, no mind, never matter. Either way, it works. Round trip. Mind creates matter. The casual plane is the world of ideas that creates the universe. Right at the top of the casual plane is what we call the Godhead. It's the first place into the universe of form. It's the first world of form. It's the place where the mind that is God manifested into the universe is thought manifested into all the lower levels of the casual plane, all the astral planes and the physical plane. And when you go back, 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 you go to that place where you become one with the Godhead. You are God. You are the idea that lies behind the universe. You are literally it. You're not making believe you're it. You are it. And the funny thing is, you're still not finished. And as far as the Buddhist is concerned, you haven't even begun the trip you're still hung up on form. Because he says, baby, it's all illusion. No matter how groovy it gets, the physical plane is obviously an illusion. All a dream, you go to bed at night and dream. You notice about your dreams, they're very real, and yet they don't have any substance on the physical plane. That's the astral plane. You're dreaming on the astral plane. At the point of pure ideas, sometimes very high physicists or poets touch pure idea. Sometimes music, art, a vase, a hieroglyph, or something gets so essency you feel you are touching God. By being in connection with that piece of art, because it's pure idea, it's the idea of vastness, it's casual plane, the mind, at the casual plane, created that vase that place of pure idea. It's the place where yin and yang manifest. It's the place where duality exists. The first place into form from the eminent duality is the unmanifest from the formless. You come into that place where you there is energy becoming form. In order to become a fully realized being, you must delight to the exquisiteness at every single level. You must take joy in your maleness or femaleness 
at the same moment that you realize you are both male and female. It's that far out. But then you go through the final door and you go from form into the formless, into the void, into the beyond, the beyond. When you have crossed the ocean of samskara, the ocean of illusion, the ocean of attachment, call it what you will, it's the same ocean. When you have crossed through all form, you enter the state of formlessness. It is eternally quiet. It is eternally quiet. It never was. Push far enough into the void, hold fast enough to quietness, and all the 10,000 things, none but can be worked on by you, I have beheld them, whether they go back, see all things howsoever they flourish, return to the roots from which they grew. This return to the roots is called quietness. Quietness is called submission to fate. What has submitted to fate becomes part of the always so. To know the always so is to be illumined. Not to know it means to go blindly to disaster. So says Lao Tzu in the Tao Te Ching, to go you've got to go the whole trip all the way to the back before you get to the place where you see that behind all this there is all this in its um, in its unmanifest form, always, eternally, you perceive that nothing is really happening at all. Nothing ever happens. Nothing is going to happen. There's nothing you've got to do. There's no doer to do it anyway. And then you're in the void. And then the Buddha nature sees there are many beings whose veils are very thin and you can come back and teach them through your being. That's the Bodhisattva role because you finally understand that through it is all illusion. It never was and never will be. At every level at which you exist, you're part of everybody else because it's all one being. Really? That's the Bodhisattva problem. So what happens is you go all the way out and then you come back to here. He who clings to the void and neglects compassion does not reach the highest stage. But he who practices only compassion does not gain release from the toils of existence. He, however, who is strong in the practice of both remains neither in samsara nor in nirvana. He neither remains in the void nor in the world. The final place that the game leads to is where you live consciously in all of it, which is in nothing. You are eternal. You have finished perishing. There is no fear of death because there is no death. It's just a transformation, an illusion, and yet, seeing all that, you still chop wood and carry water, you still do your thing, you flow in harmony with the universe. You are beyond morality, and yet your actions are totally moral, because that's the harmony of the universe. You see that to do anything with attachment, with desire, with anger, greed, lust, fear, is only creating more karma which is keeping you in the game, on the wheel of birth and death. Once you see through that, desires can't help but fall away. Watch it. But at first, when you see, you want to run down the streets shouting, spreading the good news, run down the aisles of churches yelling, listen to those words you're singing. It's really here. They're all true. You're singing about it all, just like the book says. Don't be psychotic. Watch it. Watch it. The psychosis business is an interesting business. If you go through the doorway too fast and you're not ready for it, you're bound hand and foot and thrown into outer darkness. You may land anywhere. 
And lots of people end up in mental hospitals. The reason they do is they went through the door with their ego on and wow, I've been invited to the wedding feast. I mean, dig me, Sam Jones. Sam Jones in heaven? Sam Jones standing on the right side of the Lord? There's the Lord, and there's Gabriel, and there's Sam Jones. They don't understand that you gotta die to be born. That only when you have been born again do you enter the kingdom of heaven. So they've gone in on the first round, and what happens is they go on a huge ego trip, and it's called the messianic complex. It's called paranoia, delusions, or grandeur. I have a relative who is in a mental hospital. He thinks he is Christ. Well, that's groovy. I am Christ also, but he doesn't think I am Christ. He thinks he is Christ because it happened to him and he took his ego with him. So he says, I'm special. And when I say to him, sure, man, you're Christ and I'm Christ too, he says, you don't understand. And when he's out, he steals cars and things like that because he needs them because he's Christ. And that's all right. So they lock him up and he says, I don't know, me, I'm a responsible member of society. I go to church, me, they put me in a mental hospital. You're free. You've got a beard. You wear a dress. You sure? Because as far as I'm concerned, we are all God. That's the difference. If you really think another guy is God, he doesn't lock you up. Funny about that. You've got to be really pure. You can't just make believe you're pure. Anything less than total purity. Back into outer darkness. That's what you learn after a couple hundred psychedelic trips. I might as well go straight because I'm beginning to feel like a yo-yo. I keep going up and coming down, up, down, down, up, down. But when the king came in to behold the guests, he saw there was a man who had notion a wedding garment, and he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou thither not having a wedding garment? And he was so speechless. Then the king said to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. As long as there is an up, down, in your head, outer darkness. As long as you're in the world of yin-yang, outer darkness. It takes a lot of purification. Purification of what? Purification of thought purification of body, freedom from attachment, and after a long time of going up and down without understanding why I was going up and down or how to stop it, slowly, slowly, it dawned on me. Now, why did I keep trying? The answer is very simple, and almost all of you know the answer already. The answer is, once the seed has been planted, once you have been born again, you don't have any choice. The next message is where you are when you hear the next message. Whenever you're ready, you'll hear the next message. The interesting thing is there's always a next message, and it's always available to you. Now, that's a hard one. The handwriting is always on the wall saying, Magic Theater, for Mad Men Only, Price of Admission, Your Mind. Always there. Question is, can you see it? Funny thing about all the secrets of the East or the secrets of mysticism, they're not secret. Nobody's saying don't tell him. They're telling you. They're yelling it. They're saying, except ye be converted and become as little children again, ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's a secret? Think of how many times you've heard that and you say, yeah, that's really interesting. That's great. That's the minister talking. He's doing his thing. He's got a living to earn. He's a good guy. The secret is a secret to you because of where your head is at. Your receiving mechanism isn't tuned for that particular frequency. 
In my case, I kept reading the books, but I didn't understand them. They were yelling the secrets, but I couldn't hear them because I was looking at them from the wrong place. That was my problem, and I couldn't get my head into the right place. I still wanted to know I knew. See? I was still Western rational, man. So I went and I looked and I looked and I looked. And as long as I looked like a rational man looking, I didn't find anything. I just found my own shadow all the time. That's all you'll ever find, yourself. You only read to yourself. You only talk to yourself. You only ever know yourself. That's all there is, strangely enough. I saw that my whole game didn't work. It gave me all the rewards that seemed to be offered, but it didn't work. There was a place in me that knew it wasn't working. I knew there was something else, but I couldn't get to it. At that point, I gave up, and then I was ready for the next message. When I went through the doorway, I thought, wow, it isn't like I thought at all. I mean, if I'm going to spend my life manipulating this puny ego through a set of power games and sensual gratification, what's the payoff? The end is that it's going to end anyways because it's all in time. And suddenly I dig who I am at that moment when I'm stoned. Hi, I am out of time. I am out of space. But boy, does it feel valid. Does it feel real? It feels like the first real thing that's ever happened to me. Everything else had a certain hustle-like quality to it, except my suffering. Am I he? I was really into my suffering. You can really get into your suffering. Self-pity, that's real. Everything else may go, but boy, you've got to suffer. It's the same for all of us. We're just coming out of the dark night of the Protestant ethic. Suffer, baby. That's the only way you'll be good. It feels so good to hurt so bad. We've all been on that trip. Suffering is great. It's like straightening by fire. It's purifying. It's very good. A funny thing, want another paradox? This trip requires total suffering, but it's got to be suffering that is no suffering. You've got to go the whole suffering trip, but you can't be the guy who is suffering. Do you think that when Christ is lying there and they're nailing the nails in, he's saying, oh man, does this hurt? He's probably looking at the guy who's nailing him with absolute compassion. He digs why the cat's doing it, why he's stuck in, how much dust covers his eyes, why he's got to be doing it. That's the way it is. He said the night before, well, tomorrow is the big trip. Yeah, right. These are the nails. Wow. Look at that. Am I he who is being pained? No. That's the thing. Once you know that then, pleasure and pain, loss and gain, fame and shame are all the same. They're all just happening. You're standing on a bridge, watching yourself go by. Wow. Look at that. 